College basketball 1983, the struggle to the top. I'm Al McGuire, and I'll be your host for the Playboy All-America Show. In an action-packed half hour, we'll take a look at the 10 best basketball players in America. I guarantee you won't believe your eyes. The skyscrapers of Chicago were the background for some other kinds of skyscrapers. The 10 top basketball players in the country. And me, Coach Al McGuire, the guy in the right, got together for the Playboy All-American Weekend. We took a stroll back to the playgrounds to talk about the players' lives and their college careers. My co-host, Playboy sports editor Anson Mount, handpicked the team and did he do a super job. Some of the most talked about players in the country were selected, as well as some unheralded players who will step into the national spotlight this season. We all know that college basketball is the most exciting sport around. In the next half hour, you'll see some unbelievable plays and meet some talkative blue chippers. So stay tuned for America's basketball superstars. American, you have to have the skills to stand above the crowd all season. The competition is intense, and Playboy selects only those players who have combined consistency with brilliance. Anson Mount and I talk about the hard work it takes for a ball player to become a Playboy All-American. Well, looking over the list of these ten blue chip thoroughbreds, I, I, I really think that they, they all will be high first round draft choices in the NBA when their moment comes or when their class graduates or they happen to go hardship in their sophomore or junior year. But great ball players are made in the off season, Anson. They're not made from October 15th to the finals of the NCAA. They're made from April 1st to October 15th. A lot of people don't understand this. You mean that's when they, they practice? Or? That's when they practice. That's when they hit the blacktops, the slabs. We call it playgrounds, uh -huh. the wire uh -huh. fences. That's when they, they get ahead of the crowd. From the playground to the NCAA championship title is a road traveled by very few people. But North Carolina's amazing guard, Mike Jordan, made the transition to basketball superstar in only his freshman year. We're in a playground now in the blacktop. You spent most of your life playing in playgrounds? I have. Uh, hard work and sweat and tears and all that, too. Michael, the shot that was heard around the world in the finals against Georgetown, I guess there was about 50 or 60,000 people there and maybe 60 million watching. What were you thinking about when you took that shot? I mean, I was just trying to concentrate on what I had to do, keep my follow through up. and. Uh, just concentrate and follow through my uh, shot. Did you know it was that important, the shot? Yeah, I did. I knew it could be a, a game-winning situation, and uh, let's try to do the best that I could. Why didn't you get the ball to Perkins or to Worthy? Well, Coach wanted to uh, run that offense because, you know, the time before I was open, and uh, he saw that, and he said that I would be open this time, so he ran it. Mike was an important part of the Tar Heels offense all season long. One of the few freshmen ever to start under head coach Dean Smith. Michael's offensive prowess earned him Atlantic Coast Conference Rookie of the Year honors in 82. Hot dog may not be a nice term in college basketball, but when I visited the Chicago Zoo with a couple of the guys, hot dog smothered with mustard sure sounded fine. We're at the Lincoln Park Zoo here. You can notice the Chicago skyline in the background. I got two skyscrapers with me here. Dale Ellis from the University of Tennessee and Sam Perkins from the NCAA championship team and from New Orleans last year. 
Sam, getting that ring was a big thrill? Yeah, it was a big thrill for us. Uh, it was a great accomplishment, and we did a lot for it to get it. You know what's going to happen now? James Worthy uh, went hardship, so you're the leader. Well, I don't think he's the only leader there, but uh, he did go hardship, and we got other players who, uh, who take the same responsibility as I will, and uh, we'll go together. I never thought I would see two players chosen as All-Americans from the same team. But Jordan and Perkins are both qualified. After all, Perkins was the ACC Rookie of the Year before Jordan. He may be small for a center, but only six foot nine. But Sam's super all-around athletic talent makes him tower over his opponents. Sam will be the key man in Carolina's bid for another championship this year. It's a holiday in Chicago, and there's probably 10,000 grade school kids here. Dale, if you had an opportunity to tell these young kids something, what would you tell them? I would tell them that maybe life can be hard at times and to uh, you know, take the ups and the downs in stride and, and be happy with what you have. Uh, you know, I'm from a small place and I feel lucky that you know, I'm here today you know, talking and been given a chance to uh, make a few All-American teams. And I feel like you know, I had a talent and, and a lot of kids in my neighborhood that I grew up with had just as much talent as I did, but never really tried to work with their talent to improve, so I figured I would tell the kids to work at whatever talent they had to try to become the best. Dale Ellis may not be a household name yet, but after being second in the nation in shooting percentage and being selected Southeastern Conference Player of the Year, Ellis' senior year should be something to remember. Okay, and topping out this interview, who's going to win the NCAA next year? University of Tennessee. How about you, Sam? Well, I got to be biased. I got to go with North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> we got to move that ball from side to side and get active here. And I want the swing, man. But to attain that championship ball, season, a winning team a needs the competitive swing. edge of quality coaching. In 1983, every coach will be presented with a drastically changed game. As an experiment, the NCAA has sanctioned individual conferences to install the three-point play and the shot clock. Anson Mount talked about the rule changes with Virginia's Terry Holland, Playboy's Coach of the Year. ...being instituted by some of the conferences. I think the Atlantic Coast Conference is also using it this year. It's kind of an experimental thing. Uh, how does it work? Well, we have talked about it for a long time. It wasn't something that happened, and a lot of people say, well, it happened because of the North Carolina-Virginia game in the ACC tournament, a game on national television in which there was a lot of stalling and... That's what precipitated the clock. It's not. The ACC coaches voted five years ago for a shot clock. Now, we knew the athletic directors would turn us down, and we really didn't want a shot clock unless the rest of the country was going to go to a shot clock at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what we were saying was, we're in favor of it. We want everyone to know that we're in favor of it, but we're not going to change our conference rules until the whole nation changes their rules. We don't want to be put at a disadvantage in NCAA play. Finally, this year, we said, it's time for us to take the lead. It's time for us to do something. The tremendous argument against the shot clock is that if you use a 30-second shot clock, people will full court press, drop back into a zone defense, and everyone will end up playing the same type of defense. So we added the, the three-point play from 19 feet, which is a good three-plus feet closer than the professional three-point play. We wanted something that would be a part of the game from the beginning of the game. Anyone in college basketball certainly has the potential to make a three-point play from 19 feet. So this will help eliminate the zone defenses. You'll be forced to match up. You can't leave the good shooters open. The success or failure of the rule changes will be decided this season. But one rule of the game will stay the same. Ralph Sampson will be awesome. In a minute, I'll have an interview with college's favorite aircraft carrier. Not every kid who grows up playing on a local court becomes a seven foot four inch superstar. But two time national player of the year, Ralph Sampson is that one in a million kid. I've been saying that you're gonna be the greatest player that's ever lived six years from now. And the reason I say it is because you come from a small town, I pronounce it wrong, Harrisburg? Harrisonburg. Harrisonburg. 
and uh, Virginia, and that you never had the opportunity like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar did in the Big Apple when he was a freshman in high school, in the sophomore in high school, he was playing against college and pros. Brook Chamberlain did it in the city of brotherly love, and uh, uh, Walton out of L.A. So you never really had the opportunity. You were the greatest thing in that town when you were a freshman in high school, probably, Ralph, huh? Well, I you know, started off freshman, and then uh, we played in the area, and, and we went to the regionals and lost in the regionals uh, my sophomore year, and we was coming along pretty well. And then we just dominated my junior and senior year, so I didn't have a lot of people to play against. We had a couple teams that gave us a good run here and there, but uh, I didn't have a lot of teams every day which would give me a good challenge. And, you know, I played my best at that time. Who would be the best player you played against last year? Last year, uh, we played uh, quite a few good teams. We played North Carolina always, and they uh, give us a good game every every year. Perkins and Worthy, a combination each. We played a good Tennessee team, and, and uh, I had to play a little defense against Ellis. Uh, Ellis is tough. He takes and, you uh, high, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, and in that game, uh, those play type of players that have to take me out mm. on the wing and play good, solid defense. Uh, Gets a lot out of me, and, uh, and that's where I really like to play. Though, if I can get out on the forward and, and play good defense and, and play forward on offense. Coach, one of the things I keep hearing all over the country is that Ralph Simpson is the greatest basketball player in in, in the college game today, and shows signs of being one of the all-time greats when he becomes a pro. Uh, what kind of player is he to coach? Is, isn't there a problem coaching a player that that, that is that great? There can always be a problem, and one of the things you worry about as a coach, of course, is are you helping him reach the potential that he has? In Ralph's case, he's been a dream to coach. He's willing to do the things that the other players do. He doesn't want to be treated differently, and I think part of that is because he is seven feet four, and he's no matter where he goes, he's treated differently. And as a member of the team, he's not, and I think he really likes that. And he's made it possible for us to have great basketball teams while he's been at the University of Virginia. And let's face it, as great a player as he is, if he did not have this unselfish nature and if he wasn't willing to be just one of the guys, we would not have put the kind of records that we've put on the board for the last three years. I think he's a, he's a credit to the game. I think he really is in a lot of ways. I think his staying in school for the full four years, his decision to go after that degree, and there's no question in my mind that he'll be walking down the lawn next spring. I think it speaks well for the game of basketball at a time when somebody needs to stand up and speak, and he stands up a lot taller than most people. In the 1982 season, another center soared into national prominence. Georgetown's Patrick Ewing captured the nation's eye with his aggressive never-give-up style and his spectacular skywalking. A lot of coaches seem to say that Pat Ewing is as good as Ralph Sampson. What's your opinion? I think Ewing has made tremendous strides in his initial year. John Thompson did a magnificent job of peaking him at the right time. And I think from a defensive standpoint, I think they're, they're totally different players, that Ewing will become uh, one of the, the great players in, in basketball history. Pat, I wanted to ask you how you like playing for John Thompson. He is, in my opinion, one of the greatest people and one of the greatest basketball coaches in the country. And it must be a real joy playing for him. How do you like it? Well, I like playing for him um, a great deal. I feel um, one of the reasons why I went there was because of John Thompson. I felt like he, he was not like, going to just help me to progress on the basketball mm -hmm. but he's also going to help me progress as a person, too. So I felt that would be the best decision for me to make, so that's where I am, and I'm happy that I made that decision. What are your most vivid memories from that, that exciting championship game last year? We lost. <laughs> <laughs> we lost in the last five seconds. Yeah. Pat's 119 block shots were the second best in the nation. Only a sophomore. Pat already has the awesome skills to dominate the game from both ends of the court. You know, we're talking about Pat Ewing and Ralph Sampson, but we're forgetting the guys from the same cut of court. Sam Bowie from Kentucky. Now, last year, he had a bad wheel. But where do you put him in this entourage? Well, I think Bowie, of course, uh, uh, has really made great strides physically. He was not a very physical player as a freshman. He was a very physical player as a sophomore. He was on the Playboy team a year ago. I think, barring any injury, 
Bowie will become one of the dominant forwards. Now, Al, he likes to play forward, and I think that's his, uh, his best position. Uh, he can shoot, he can handle the ball, he's uh, got some good power moves. He may be forced to play center and pro ball, but I personally think when he eventually turns pro that he'll be one of the better forwards in the history of basketball because he can do a lot of things at seven feet. Sam and I took a walk on Chicago's north side and talked about his past year. Why don't you kind of relate to me the injury last year? You took a year off, so to say, your wheel went out on you. <laughs> right, well, my situation was, at first we thought it was uh, shin splints. I never experienced shin splints before, so I really didn't know what to expect when the doctors were asking me about this situation. I got a picture taken, and the pictures came out negative. There was no fracture at all. Two weeks later, I went back to the same hospital. Fracture showed up that it was a stretch fracture, not a complete fracture. Huh. And um, in a lot of cases, the doctor has to go in and break the bone completely. And that way there, the body knows that there's a need for some healing. But in a stretch fracture, it's so small a fracture that the body doesn't know that it needs to recover. And that's where I was at. My first thought, I was scared because I said, you know, basketball has been my whole life. And looking at things realistically, financially, the game of basketball is hopefully to do a lot of things for me and my family. So um, I was scared myself, and then every three to four weeks I would go back to the doctor and expecting him to give me the go-ahead to start working out, and, and it would show up on the films that it was still not completely mm -hmm. healed. Well, you're now the breadwinner. It's a sad story. Your dad died last year quite suddenly. Well, my dad was probably one of the most influential persons in my life, especially in the game of basketball. I've been raised around the basketball environment, and... Uh, like I said, that was a shock to me, and I still feel as though I have an obligation for him and my mother and my sister, and I just hope that obligation will be fulfilled. Although Sam has been out of action for more than a year, everyone still expects him to tear up the league when he returns. Stay tuned as Sam and his buddies visit Chicago's Wrigley Field. Baby? All right. Hey, I got some, I can dribble now. Being at Wrigley Field to meet the Chicago Cubs was a lot of fun for the guys. <laughs> if I had this guy's height, to know how far I could hit the ball. See that Torco sign up there? While the Cubs warmed up for their game, I talked with one of the nation's top guards. John Sunvold of Missouri about his radar shooting. Throughout the country, people are talking about the Sunvolt rim. Now, I don't completely understand. I know it's a smaller rim than a normal, but what's the background and, and the tradition of this? Well, it's a rim that when my dad was a young kid, he went to a neighbor and uh, he wanted to play basketball. So they, the neighbor, they got a ball and they put the rim, he got a piece of metal and they put it around it and they welded it to that shape. So it's 14 inches diameter, which is four inches smaller than a normal rim. So it wasn't by design. It just happened, and we've had it in my family, you know, ever since my dad's a little kid. And that's... Oh, your dad played with the rim? Yeah, so it's been hanging on our garage, you know, since he was a youngster. And when we moved, we've always had it. And you, you feel this is what made you a great shooter? Well, I'd say it helped, but I think when you shoot at it eight hours a day, that's probably more important. While John has been at Missouri, the Tigers have won three consecutive Big 8 titles. Last summer, John helped lead the American national team into the finals of the World Basketball Championship in South America. A player you may not have heard much about is Ennis Watley of Alabama. Last year as a freshman, Ennis started every Crimson Tide game. Playing point guard, he had 178 assists while averaging 12 points a game. But beyond any stats, every All-American has to have the ability to make the pressure play and the impossible shot. If Ennis were a TV show, he might be. That's incredible. Freshman Keith Lee of Memphis State might have been the biggest surprise of last year. The six foot ten forward led the Tigers in scoring and rebounding. His 102 block shots were among the best in the country, and he was the only freshman last year 
to averaging double figures in both scoring and rebounding. Keith Lee is probably one of the true franchises in college ball. I'll be right back to look at the man they call Doc. Playboy All-America Glenn Rivers grew up in Chicago, and Glenn and I returned to his dad's record shop to talk about Glenn's career. Comes a time in everyone's life that they have to gently pack the basketball away. Then what? Well, I'm in political science now, and I'm minoring in business, and plan to go to law school sooner or later. Hope to have a pro career, and I'll go to law school during the summer. It'll take a while, but I definitely want a law degree. Do you feel any, like, um, degrading being a ball player, being an athlete in college? Is there a tendency for people to underestimate your intelligence? Yes, that's a big problem in college. Uh, when I walk in class, people look at you and laugh almost. And, uh, just thinking you're feeling Just thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm there just so I can uh, have attendance and the teacher give me the grade. That's not true. Uh, at least it's not true at Marquette. I can't speak for other schools. And that makes you feel bad. It makes you feel like the dumb jock that everybody thinks you are. They're stereotyping, and I don't think that's fair to us because I think most athletes are pretty bright. When Glenn goes to court, the defense can never rest. Known at Marquette as Doc, Glenn's 180 and 360 moves defy the law of gravity. With 65 steals last year, Doc rested his case. The All-America's Weekend in Chicago ended with a photo session that you'll catch in December's Playboy. Okay, what's your name? Mike? Okay, Mike and Ralph, just, I gotta get a little space right here. This is the center of the page. So you guys will be in the gutter and we won't see you. So we'll leave a little space right here, okay? As a basketball person, I genuinely enjoyed my experience with these 10 great blue chip athletes. I hope you enjoyed meeting them as much as I did. I know that we'll be seeing great basketball this season from the Playboy All-Americans.